Well, good morning, one and all. Welcome to uh, the latest in our series of live economics revision sessions. We're going to pivot to micro today and do a, a half an hour session on market contestability, which is uh, super important. But uh, isn't every topic important? Thanks for the suggestions coming through in the live chat, by the way, for the topics for next week. I think we're doing them on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm away Tuesday, Thursday on giving presentations in various places. So I think we'll definitely do labor markets. We'll probably do something on globalization. And uh, maybe one more. So post uh, post a comment in the chat window, and we'll select one of them for the topics for next week. All of them, of course, are put on the playlist. So if you want to go through previous editions, uh, just uh, select the playlist, and they're there for you. And if you're watching on replay, you can download all of the presentations as well from each session, and they become live just a few minutes after we finish. Well, what a great group as always uh, joining us this morning, including some familiar names. Uh, that are joining us, our Tutor to you student collective that are absolutely going to smash these exams in the weeks ahead. Uh, I, I haven't had a haircut, by the way. It's just uh, just the way I look on a Thursday morning. I do have a haircut planned. Actually, I've got a, I've got my own personal hairdresser, and he charges me three pounds uh, plus a fifty pound search fee. Now we're going to start off with uh, a, a big reveal. Now, yesterday it was which country. Uh, today it's which business? So I'm going to give you five clues and uh, post the answer in the chat window if you can work out which business it is. Uh, first of all, their product is supplied directly to homes. The product is supplied directly to homes. What do we think? Any answers coming through? Uh, Thames Water says Ben Richards. Amazon, Martin, that's a Hello Fresh, says Sean. What do we got? Uh, British Gas, Amazon, Ikea. Ikea. 
Second clue, they started trading and selling energy in 2009. So it's a business that hasn't been around a long time. It actually emerged, as many businesses did, in the, in the aftermath of the global recession. And I'm still looking in the chat window for the right answer. Uh, so you're getting pretty warm, pretty hot. Uh, CEO Raman Bhatia is actually leaving the business to take over at another challenger bank. Well, we mentioned Monzo and Revolu in the, in the poll, Starling. Okay, and I think we do have the right answer, which we'll showcase in a minute. Well done to the to Faye and to Jack, I think, who were the first two in. Well done. Uh, this business was fined £7 million last year for overcharging customers, including myself. And the final clue <laughs> is that it's now one of the big six energy providers after they acquired SSE. So this is a business which essentially started in 2009, uh, and yet it is um, uh, one now one of the big six in that oligopolistic industry. And the answer is, as Faye and Jack got, it's Ovo Energy. Sachs says, what is Ovo? Well, it's a, it's a third rate energy company, one of the lowest customer ratings on which. And anyway, I'm glad to be rid of them. Here we go. Let's move on to some multiple choice questions on contestable markets. Here's the three. These, these are all past questions, of course. So well done. The manufacture of some sports equipment is dominated by large firms. Indeed it is. But there are also some smaller firms in the industry. What enables a small firm to exist in such an industry? What do we think? So what do we think? What, what enables a small firm to in, exist in such an industry? A couple of people choosing uh, A, but most people, Liam and Jack, the Snack Bandit, Ben, uh, Millie and Felix, Ezra and Alex all going with D. Let's have a look. It is indeed D. So typically in a contestable market, you can attack, attack a niche section, personalized personalization of equipment, personalized services, niche segments. So well done to Harry and Vidika and Lloyd for getting the right answer as well. Here's question number two. Well done. The th oh, now this might, this might get some of you. The theory of contestable markets can be applied to which market structures? Is it A, B, C, or D? So where, in which market structures can you apply the theory of contestable markets? What do we think? Those of you who are Edexcel fans, presumably those who are taking Edexcel exams, contestable markets is super important. A lot of people saying A, a few people saying B, uh, and C, a few people saying C. But most people, uh, so, uh, so look, most people saying, Oh, loud says, sorry, Jeff, I'm on school Wi-Fi, so there's a bit of a delay. Well, that says a lot about school Wi-Fi, doesn't it? So, uh, what have we got? Well, a lot of people saying C. Quite a few saying A. The answer is, in fact, it is A. You can apply contestable markets to any market structure, any market structure, including monopoly competition, which is essentially a contestable market. So the principles which we're going to go through today, got, I've got a hot take on two contestable markets, two markets you might not have studied before. I was trying to think of two markets which the examiners would be interested in. But you can apply it to any market structure. Let's have a look at question number three. Teddy says, even a natural monopoly. Indeed, you can apply contestable markets to any market structure. I mean, other than perfect competition. Freddie says, but a monopoly is only one single seller. That's indeed, Freddie, congratulations on that. But even in a monopoly, you have the threat of competition. We'll come back to that in a second. What is a characteristic of a highly contestable market? Now, this is a harder question because some of the answers are quite subtle here. What is characteristic of a highly contestable industry? Again, quite a difference of opinion. A lot of people saying A, a lot of people saying B. Uh, Lloyd says, Jeff, can we have a definition of contestability? That's the next question coming up, Lloyd. We're going to have a, a team, team go at that question. Okay, so what do we think? A lot of people, I think the majority of people are probably saying a, let's check the answer. It is indeed A. Typically in a contestable market, abnormal profits get competed away by actual and the threat of competition. Um, you often have a lot of advertising in these kind of markets, but it's not, it's not the key feature of contestability. It's just a feature of product differentiation. Uh, the other two answers are incorrect. Well, moving on from that, everybody, let's, let's try this uh, question. Uh, over to you on this one. Again, let's test our understanding. Can you please give me one important characteristic of a contestable market? Have a go, over to you. Now, 
Uh, you can pick out anything you like. Let's see your, the collective wisdom of the group this morning. Millie is saying, Jeff, what is an abnormal profit? It's otherwise not known, Millie, as super normal profit. But we're looking here for some characteristics of contestable markets. And already in the chat window, some great answers coming through. Now, a few people are saying a contestable market, a market with lots of firms. You don't necessarily have to have lots of firms for the market to be contestable, as we'll see. It's an important point. Ezra has a brilliant, a brilliant answer, which I think we'll probably pick up. And it's on the screen. There it is. If you want, if Carlsberg did answers to this question, Ezra's will be pretty close. But there's some great answers coming through. Okay, incumbent firms are forced back competitively as they face the threat of new firms ready to enter the market. Low barriers, often sunk costs. Yep. Uh, really good stuff. Um, Jamie talking about the constant threat of potential competition. Uh, Kieran talking about incumbent firms don't have power over new firms. In other words, the there's, a, there's a, a level playing field when it comes to, for example, industry technologies. Uh, what else have we got here? A lot of people are talking about sunk costs, which is excellent. Um, incumbent. Oh, yeah, great question from Sachs. Incumbent means existing, established firm. So if you think about banking, you know, Barclays, NatWest, Lloyds would be the incumbent firms, whereas Monzo, Revolu, Starling would be the challenger brands. As Houser says, the incumbent is already there and established in the industry, and Faye agrees with that. And by the way, when you get a question on contestable markets, do use these terms, incumbents, challengers. They really are very good phrases to use. Scarlett says, what are sunk costs? Well, let, let me, let's move on to the next slide, and then we'll uh, have a little bubble quiz on this. Key characteristic is the absence of sunk costs. Now, sunk cost is spending that has already been made. You've made a, a commitment and is ir irrecoverable in whole or in part, regardless of whether a firm continues operating in the market or decides to exit. So if you've got big sunk costs, you pile, I don't know, £500,000 into a, into a business, and if you leave the market, you might get half of it back, maybe not even half. So there's a sunk cost element. And Will has a lovely, a lovely uh, little definition, an irreversible cost. Really good. And by the way, thanks to the group for uh, suggesting answers to people. We can't answer every question that comes through, but uh, one of the joys of this group is it's very supportive. Well, let's let's have a look at this then. That's the other of the absence of sunk costs. Here's a bubble quiz question for everybody. Which of these are considered examples of sunk costs? So I've put four examples on the screen for you. What do we think? Loss of business reputation, asset write-offs project cancellation costs, and increase in labour costs. George, we're going to go over the contestable market diagram right at the end. We're going to walk through the key diagram for everybody right at the end today. So what do we think here? Sophie says B and C. A lot of people saying B and C. Uh, uh, pseudo going counterintuitively saying C and B or B and C. Victor says A, B and C. Now, none of you are saying D, which is good. Here's the answer coming up. It's actually all the first three. So when you have to write off the value of assets, that's a sunk cost. A fire sale of equipment, for example. A project cancellation costs, think about the sunk costs associated with HS2. Uh, but loss of business reputation is a good one to add to your revision notes. Snack Bandit says A is a good shout. Shout out to Snack Bandit for that. It's an intangible sunk cost. Really good example is if you, uh, if you offer a new product to the market, people buy it and then you leave the market. You, you can cheese off, that's a nice way of putting it, you can cheese off a lot of customers who uh, who might be then less willing to buy your product uh, in the future. So the loss of reputation or goodwill is often an intangible but significant sunk cost. Question number two on the bubble quiz, which of these grocery chains have a or had a market share of more than 10%? And I'm drawing on the data from Cantor from February 2024. So here we go. Favourite topic for the examiners. Um, which of these grocery chains? Lidl, Aldi, Waitrose and Asda. Had a market share of more than 10%. Peter goes for B, C, D. Dan the man says A, B and D. George, B and D. 
Jeff Riley says A and D. Don't know who he is. Rhys says C and D. Ben says A, B, C, and they could all be over 10%. Harry says B and D. Uh, Pigeon says all of them. Okay. Um, obviously, our international student community might be struggling here, but take a take a go. Sophie says, no, nah, it's just, just, just as done. Okay. Ted says Waitrose is tiny. It is actually. It's only about 3%. Here's the answers coming up. It's B and D. Aldi um, cracked up to now the fourth biggest. Asda uh, is in there. So Little's not far off 10%, but it's a bit way behind. Waitrose is about 3%. Okay, let's crack on then. So what I want to do, um, oh, some, yeah, here we go. I want to take two industries, uh, two industries which you may not have covered yet, but I just I just wanted to pick two markets which I think have some interest for examiners because they're kind of topical and they haven't yet been tested as far as I know. Let's look at the first one. Let's read through this together if it's okay. Uh, hair and beauty businesses in the UK, as you know, I, this is something I spend a lot of time, money and effort on. So the more than nearly 50,000 hair and beauty businesses in the UK in 2022, 95% of them are small, so more than 10 people. Uh, 85, 87% is female. A lot of people working between the ages of 16 and 34. There were over 4,000 male salons in the UK in 2022. Um, and quite a few have opened since the pandemic. So this is a really interesting market. By the way, breaking news, uh, last weekend I went to the World Manicure Championships absolutely amazing competition and it was a nail biting finish so there's the nail industry in the uk we're moving on here's some data so this could be the data you get this is the number of hairdressing and other beauty treatment salons in the uk by turnover so on the x-axis you've got the annual revenue of a business in pounds and on the y-axis the number of enterprises okay see that says you feel that they're money laundering schemes interesting i think you've nailed it uh, but here's the question. Here's the question. To what extent does the data suggest that the UK beauty treatment sector is a contestable market? So we're going to have a minute or so on this. Do, do type your answers in the, into the chat. Pick out some data. But to what extent does the data suggest that this is a contestable market? Have a go. You have the data there on hairdressing salons. You also have the data on the extract. Millie says, Jeff should become a comedian. Well, people laughed when they said, I wanted to be a comedian. I'm not laughing now. House has a good answer there. We're not told what the profits are, House does, so we'd have to use the data. So a little bit of data response required here. So paying the goat has a has a, a good day. Most firms are in that 10 to 49, 49,000 one. But critically, you need to use the data and the answer. I'll give you a little bit of a clue. There we go. Yeah, so Michael's got a good answer there. If there's data in the extract, everybody, there has to be data in the answer. So uh, answers are coming through. Yeah, George talking about high number of firms with the data with small amounts of turnover. Uh, majority of firms uh, make sub 50k in revenue, which is good. Here's Felix's answer: the low barriers to entry have with most firms not making more than 50,000, 500,000 pounds per annum. The attraction of supermodel pop profit typically would not be there for hit and run firms. Um, yeah, some good stuff there. Gregor, very contestable. Lots of low revenue small businesses, 21,000 under 50k a year. Suggesting the barriers to entry on that higher market is contestable. Low sun. I think you can imply the, the low sun costs, which is good. Let me just quickly look at my answer. I mean, these are really good, by the way. George talking about over 70% of enterprises. Now, that's really good from George because he's manipulated the data a little bit. So he's taken the first two, the 21 and the 15, and just done a quick, a quick uh, calculation there that uh, if you add those together, we're talking about 37,000 out of 48. That is really good data use from George there. Uh, really good. So the modal number, mean mode, etc., median. So the modal number is 21,380, is less than 50,000. So use that as the um, as the bit of data uh, data application. Only five businesses have a turnover in excess of 10 to 50 million. 95% of businesses employ fewer than 10 people. So the data suggests that the market is fragmented. 
many local competing businesses, often pop-up stores in, in shopping centres and things. Energy barriers and sun costs will be low, creating high contestability. Good stuff. So moving on, here's my second market. Now I just have a feeling this could be a great exam style question. Okay, so I'm going to ask three questions on this market. It's the UK meal kit market. Maybe post in the chat window if you have actually, or if your family have these things delivered. Uh, just very quickly in terms of the extracts there. So it's a, a fast growing market. Hello Fresh, created in Germany in um, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, came to the UK in 2012. Shares in our trade on the stock market. And HelloFresh, as of last year, had 43% of the UK market, well ahead of Gusto, 34%. The data you have there is 2021 on the right hand side. So both HelloFresh and Gusto have increased their market share. But then you have businesses like Feastbox, Mindful Chef, uh, Riverford, uh, Simply Cook, Morrison's tried to break into the market. Um, so there has been more competition. Um, the supermarket chain Morrison's attempted to enter the market, but discontinued their Eat Fresh meal kit delivery brand late in 2021. They're obviously trying to ride on the back of the uh, of the um, pandemic, I guess. So some people are suggesting, uh, so Dan Man says, HelloFresh knocked on my door, trying, trying to ask me to sign up. So there's, the, there's a bit of ex some data. Following on from that, an interesting chart coming up. Uh, showing the revenue of the industry. This is a market which is growing. So back to 2018, just under $400 million in the UK. It's getting towards a $2 billion, convert to pounds if you want, uh, market. So this is a market which is growing, certainly grew during the pandemic, but maybe hints that it's growing less quickly. And the next chart shows the revenue for HelloFresh. So HelloFresh is quite a big business and you can see that growth in 2020, obviously, and then 2021. Uh, up to 2022 and then suddenly in 2023 their revenues stopped growing and I just think of as, as a kind of as an economic market to study the impact of the cost of living crisis on HelloFresh seems to be coming apparent they've had to they've issued a number of profit warnings so very very fast growth but now clearly leveling off and the final chart I wanted to show you, which could be, oh, so here's, no, here's a question for, we'll come back to that in a second. So again, okay, here we go, have we go, one minute question. To what extent is the UK meal kit industry contestable? Over to you, have we got the answer? I've given you some background on the UK meal kit industry. You may or may not be familiar with it. What can you pick out and share with us on the screen and in the chat window, what can you pick out about the extent to which this is a contestable market? Keep in mind, you only have a minute. You have more longer than the exam. What have you managed to assimilate in that little read through of the data? Again, we're looking for data in the answer and data can be in words or it could be figures. Okay. If there's data in the extracts, there needs to be data in the answer. Some answers coming through. Now we're going to leave the screen up for a second because oftentimes there's a little bit of a lag on the chat window and some great answers come through, which we can sometimes miss. So we're not going to do that. Libby says, yeah, easy to run small scale, uh, no high brand loyalty, although HelloFresh has 43% of the market. And what are we saying here? Some good answers coming through. Ah, the Snack Bandit says, um, come back to him in a second, Sudo. We'll say it's somewhat contestable, closer to an imperfect oligopoly. Okay, I don't have the data, but the three and firm concentration ratios are rather high. Well, you could work out the two firm concentration ratio, kind of, but it's given in the extract. Um, yeah, what have we got here? Highly contestable. Another interesting point is that delivery can be outsourced meaning there's no requirement for high fixed costs in entry. That is a really good point. Indeed, HelloFresh, they do have their own delivery systems, but they largely outsource delivery to the likes of DHL, for example, or the post office. So outsourcing. Yeah, it talks many small firms with small market share. HelloFresh, the leader of the market, a dominant uh, market share, are struggling the profits, which may suggest hit and run entry. So maybe suggesting that some of those new firms in the chart might be chipping away at HelloFresh's market share. So some really good stuff. More people talk about Connor talk about Morrison's discontinuing. 
So the fact that Morrison was able to enter the market and leave suggests low fixed costs. George, many, oh, can we go back to George's point? Um, many firms operating in it suggesting there are low barriers to entry. However, HelloFresh operate with a 43% market share suggesting there is a monopoly or certainly a working monopoly. Yeah, really good stuff there. Um, and Ben Richards talking about the plateau in revenue for HelloFresh. Kind of coincided with cost of increase suggests it's a normal good. Contestability depends on economic conditions. Really good point from Ben there. To what extent will smaller firms struggle to survive in this industry, given if given the fall in real disposable incomes uh, going forward? This is quite interesting, isn't it? So you, you, I've given you a new market. You may not have studied it in class. It doesn't matter. What am I saying? Here we go. I think the UK meal, in, meal kit industry is a duopoly with HelloFresh and Gooster having 77% of the market. But new entrants have launched, including Riverford, who specialise in all organic produce. Uh, low entry barriers and extra costs help make this market contestable. For example, Morrison's trialled meal kits before exiting in 2021. It's actually an amalgam, really, of some of the great answers that came through the, uh, the chat window. And Faye talking about incumbent firms needing to, needing to be productively efficient to ensure they maintain their 33% market share. And 33% is above the threshold for a working or legal monopoly. Sack says, that's a really good answer, Jeff. Thanks, Sack. It took me a long time to, to write that, at least five hours to write that paragraph. But the key thing is do a little bit of data manipulation. Um, HelloFresh is the dominant player. Gusto is the major rival. So you could almost bring a bit of game theory in there because essentially they're competing with each other. They've both got to scale. Does anyone know why Morrison's left the market? I think they were making losses. They just didn't take off. I mean, they tried it. And I think other supermarkets may well do the same. I mean, it makes obvious sense because they've already got a distribution network. So why not offer meal kits to distribute to houses through their existing um, distribution network? Isaac says, does anyone know what university Jeff went to? Well, I think, I think most of us know that. Um, I'll give you a clue. It wasn't Oxford. Here's a question for you. Can you give now, this is really good. So if they give you this kind of industry, they might ask slightly different questions. Can you now give me please two specific economies of scale that might be achieved by a business such as HelloFresh? Have a go on this one, please. So let's say they give you the meal kit industry. HelloFresh has grown rapidly, although sales have plateaued. Can you pick out two specific economies of scale that HelloFresh might achieve. And blue make, and that is specific. That is a really good specific economy of scale there from blue. What we tend to find in exams is that students write in generic terms about scale economies. Libby hasn't talked about purchasing economies of scale, hire procurement managers to talk to suppliers or negotiate with suppliers. Ellie drives that point home nicely with a bulk buy point. I'll develop that answer a little bit more from Melania. Yeah, it's good stuff. Now, the more specific you can be and the more concepts you can use, the better. Some really good answers there. Most of you talk about purchasing economies of scale, which is fine. Uh, and also one or two people, uh, Harry and Jack, talk about financial economies of scale. Okay. Uh, Siani talking about marketing commerce of scale. So you might have a fixed marketing budget per year. Well, spread over 10 customers, it's very expensive. Spread over, I don't know, a million customers. It, the unit cost of marketing come down. So it's a really good scale economy. Gives firms um, cost advantage over rivals. So some good stuff. Yeah, William Smart Molinero talking about external scale economies. You need to be probably focused on internal unless it asks for external. Here are my two answers coming through. Uh, first of all, uh, purchasing economies that I talked about. HelloFresh can negotiate better prices with suppliers, suppliers of raw ingredients, the packaging, other inputs, and critically, they order in bulk and they have monopsony power. Does that concept resonate with you? So always link monopsony power to purchasing economies of scale. And then financial, HelloFresh is traded on the stock market. Okay, so it's now a public limited company. And in theory, the risk profile of businesses is improved so they can raise for us equity and perhaps borrow at cheaper interest rates. 
So some significant scale economies. And there's lots of others, but but uh, those are two good ones. Interestingly, if you look at the uh, the chart, actually, is there a chart coming up? Oh, no, sorry, I'll come back to that in a second. <laughs> Here's the, sorry, here's the data. Yeah, here's the data on prices. So again, this is the kind of thing, this is how examiners create um, data response questions. So these were the prices in 2019 and 2023 for the leading sort of five meal kit brands. And those of you who are fans of game theory might be already thinking how similar those prices are for HelloFresh and Gusto. Gusto. So game theory would suggest you get clustering around a certain price. In fact, they were the same. In 2023, to within uh, well, to win a penny on either side, one or two, one or two ones are more expensive. Riverford, for example, is more organic, so it's more expensive, and uh, there's been a significant increase in price. Next question for you. I've got a couple more questions. So, George, how can you bring game theory into this? In terms of uh, payoff matrix, do you charge a low price or a high price for your meal kits? Can you give me two factors that affect prices of businesses such as HelloFresh in this contestable market? Have a go. So we'll just finish with this question in terms of uh, the group, and then we're going to walk through the contestable markets diagram for revision. Yeah, Zach's saying, I'm sensing tacit collusion. Fantastic, Zach. Well done. Brilliant. Brilliant answer. Maybe it's the extent to which a bit of tacit collusion, or perhaps HelloFresh is a price leader in the market, which Kieran's talked about. Really good stuff. Yeah, so factors affecting pricing. So Zach straight away comes with comes in with the key concept that interdependent pricing. In the duopoly or an oligopoly, interdependent pricing is so important. So Jack talking about trade agreements, product standards. Yeah, quite a few UK um, food importers will have to pay more for their uh, imported food. What have we got there? Liam talking about changes in consumer preferences, people perhaps switching to vegan diets. Yeah, harder to find and more expensive to find those ingredients. George talking about external factors, the 270% grain price spike in mid-2022. Great point on the external side. Ted Norris talking about the exchange rate imports, uh, such as food and nuts and things. Really good stuff, really good stuff. Uh, okay, here are my two answers for uh, considerable consider time here. So things like variable costs, an increase in the cost of ingredients, packaging costs and distribution costs. So you can think about cost and revenue curve analysis there. HelloFresh is likely to pass on those higher costs if the price elasticity demand is low, for example, if it's less than one minus 0.6. And then critically, be given given that this is a contestable duopoly, and there's, there's two dominant firms, but lots of smaller firms, HelloFresh needs to consider the subscription prices set by rivals, such as Gusto, and also increasingly, maybe weaker substitutes. So perhaps the meal deals offered by supermarkets is that an alternative? Or prices for other delivery services, delivery just eat. And it's a really interesting market, the meal kit market. I think I'll do a separate video on meal kits as a little industry case study. So well done everybody, brilliant. The next one I think does actually show the share price for HelloFresh. And the share price that the business launched in 2019 on the German stock market and the share price went up from about 10 euros to nearly 90 euros but since then actually it really has struggled and HelloFresh has issued several profits warnings share price is now below issue it's now down about six euros six euros 61 so it's lost over 90 percent of its value in the last couple of years suggesting this is a business whose perhaps its best days are behind it but who knows if it's okay with you let's just finish off by thinking just walking through the diagram so in contestable market. Oh, sorry, here we go. Sorry, sorry, penultimate question. Sorry. Can you please give me two ways in which contestable markets might lead to improved efficiency? Have a go. This is a prelude to the walkthrough on the diagram. What do we think? Can you give me two ways, please, in which contestable markets might lead to an improvement in efficiency? This is very key for exams. The ADA star, you've got to link contestability to one or more types of efficiency. So have a go. <clears throat> and already some great answers coming through. You've got uh, three efficiencies you can talk about.
So when you have a, a highly contestable market, what are the uh, what are the consequences? We'll walk we'll walk through them in a second or two. Uh, Tom's answer is uh, is spot on. The threat of hitting and competition forces monopolies to keep prices lower and closer to allocative efficiency. Tom has absolutely smashed that one. Um, Victor says, in my related productive efficiency, new entrants increase the number of firms. So firms are encouraged to cut costs towards the lowest point on AC. So there's going to be more X efficiency. Martin talks about uh, the R&D investment increases due to the need to remain competitive. Um, a lot, lots of you bringing these points in, really good stuff. Let's quickly go through them together. Um, yeah, so in theory, so if, if a market is truly contestable, there's probably less need for government intervention, if that makes sense. First of all, firms are under pressure to keep prices low, because if they keep prices too high, then there's the, the, the threat, the risk of a challenge of firm entering the market. Second, in terms of dynamic efficiency, firms are encouraged to innovate a new product, a new process to keep that competitive advantage. So we typically tend to see lots of innovation in contestable markets, things like telecoms, parcel delivery companies, that kind of thing. Uh, and also there is an incentive to keep costs under control. So if you have the threat and actual competition, you get less managerial slack, you get less excellent efficiency and big firms can succeed. So as we saw, HelloFresh can achieve market dominance and can achieve scale economies. Oftentimes for some, in a contestable market, the biggest firms are the ones which uh, have achieved scale economies. Okay. I did promise you uh, the diagram. And I'm hoping for the next slide is the diagram. Here we go. Let's walk through the diagram. So this is the contestable market diagram. You don't really need a lot of diagrams in this kind of market, but here it is. So this is a downward sloping uh, demand curve. It's a monopoly diagram. And Q1 is the profit maximizing output and P1 is the price. Okay. So if we just move to the next slide. So P1, is the monopoly price, it's the profit maximizing price. And the next slide shows the total profit in the market. Shaded there in a lovely shade of orange, okay? Now, in a contestable market, it's unlikely that the price will be P1. It'll likely be lower than P1, but it depends on the threat of entry and actual competition. So in fact, we could go all the way down to P2 on the next slide, which is the price where normal profits are made, price equals average cost. And so the price you get in a contestable market is likely, as the next slide shows, the price you're going to get depends on the threat of entry. So typically when the entry threat is high, it causes firms to price at P2 or close to P2 rather than P1. And I haven't shown this on the diagram, but you can then show how this would lead to an increase in consumer surplus and increase in consumer welfare. And the stat bandit talks about limit pricing AC equals AR to deter entrance since the supermarket profit is eroded by the threat of competition. I couldn't put it better myself. So there's your diagram for contestable markets. It's not a tremendously difficult one, but it's the good one to use to get those high analysis marks. Okay, uh, well done. And my final point, if the threat of competition in the contestable market is credible, then established firms are more likely to price at lower levels, reducing profitability. Now that contestability can come from both domestic and external sources. So it could come from a challenger brands like Gymshark in the UK or Revolu, or it could come from import competition. So Santander was a challenger brand in the banking sector. Uh, AXA Insurance, okay, so oftentimes you get the emergence of challenger brands from outside an economy, particularly when you have free trade, particularly when you have, dare I say it, particularly if you're part of a single market. But that's for another day, okay? Brilliant, everybody, well done. Uh, we've gone a bit over time. But I hope, you, I hope you found that uh, 35 minutes on contestable markets useful. If you did, please consider pressing the like button because we want to be, but with two days in a row, we've beaten business studies on the likes. So like and subscribe to the channel. Spread the word, please. Uh, tomorrow we're looking at poverty and inequality. And then next week we have three sessions lined up, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for you. And then we'll crack on the week after as well. So lots of revision events. Uh, keep, the, keep the work going. Keep revising hard, keep working hard. These exams are on the near horizon now, but you can smash it and you can do so much in the next five or six weeks. You really can. So huge thanks as always for joining in. Thank you to everybody who's contributed to the live stream. 
who's been very supportive of other students. It makes a huge difference, I think, to all of us. Stay happy, stay positive, stay healthy, stay curious, and see you sometime soon.